Hey friends, there are already so many videos out about Ableton's new Roar device, so what could I possibly show you that hasn't already been covered? Well, Ableton, who sponsored this video, asked if I wanted to have a chat with the developers, and that chat was illuminating to say the least. In a sea of plugins repeating the same features over and over and over again, I believe that Roar represents an actual new sound design frontier where we can create new and fresh sound design opportunities, but in order to do so, we need to understand where those opportunities are and how to take advantage of them. So let's do it. Well, much like the Roar device, this video turned out to be a monster, so I've included timestamps if you'd like to skip around the video. Also, many of the Roar settings I use in this video can be downloaded as Roar presets using the link up here or down in the description. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so first of all, it's not my intention to put other YouTube channels on blast, but I feel like the vast majority of them missed the point of Roar. Of course it's a distortion, but Roar can also be a compressor, an EQ, an envelope follower, an insane delay, a randomizer, a filter bank, a wave shaper, a bit reducer, a sample rate reducer, a source of uncertainty, a noise generator, a band splitter, and so much more. And above all else, the main theme of Roar's design centers around not just being a distortion, but rather the changing, swirling modulation of parameters, creating movement and music where it just hasn't been done before. In the example that I played for you in the intro, each one of these Roar instances is actually utilizing the modulation system to create what I would consider new kinds of sounds. So let's go ahead and listen to this drum beat by itself. Now engaging Roar. As you can see in this example, I'm using the envelope follower to change a lot of different parameters inside of the matrix. Moving on to the second, let's go ahead and take a listen to this bass line. This is just an operator with a little bit of harmonics added to it. Let's engage it. In this example, I'm using the noise modulation source in its really interesting wander mode. And then in this third example, I'm using a really boring collision sound just by itself. But I'm sending it through Roar and I'm modulating a comb filter, creating somewhat of a chorus kind of sound. Take a listen. So the reason I'm showing you this before we get into the weeds of this deep dive is that I wanted to show you that where Roar really changes the game is when we are modulating parameters that traditionally were left in just normal static settings. So utilizing the drums from this example, let's go ahead and load up a brand new Roar. In this drive section, you can see this little LED. I'm going to go ahead and play the drums. We can see that little LED lighting up. The dev that I spoke to explained to me that the difficulty with using a nonlinear effect like Roar, what does nonlinear mean? It means that it does a different thing depending upon how much gain is going into it. With a nonlinear effect, the same preset will do vastly different things depending upon what signal is going into Roar. So what they did is they put this little LED here to indicate whether Roar is receiving sufficient enough gain to do what it does. Okay, so essentially if you're loading up Roar presets and you're not seeing this LED light up, you need to add some gain in order to get the intended effect. And of course it's also frequency dependent too, and that's why we have a tone control. So let me show you what these things do. So let's go ahead and load up the tube preamp clipping mode, and we're going to crank this up a lot. We're going to use a 50% amount here, and I'm going to compensate by turning the output down. So now let's take a listen. Right, we can hear some pretty significant distortion. Let's crank it up a bit more. Now, we can see that we're sending sufficient gain by seeing that LED light up, right? So this is where the tone control comes in. Essentially, as I pull this down, we're going to be favoring the lower frequencies into the distortion saturation stage. And what is so powerful about this is that we have really strong fundamentals. We have a big kick drum, a big tom drum. And as I pull the tone control down, yes, it's going to get darker, but what it's also going to do is it's going to feed the distortion into those lower frequencies, making the distortion react to the low end more. So take a listen as I pull this down. Now 
Now, what's cool about this is they added a color compensation. Essentially, whatever EQ curve that this tone control is doing, it'll do an opposite curve on the output, trying to compensate for whatever changes you've made here. And man, the amount of different tones you can get just by using this is just nuts. So take a listen without this. And then with it. Again, this control is just adding the same EQ on the output stage, so you have so many tonal options. Let's go the other way. Now this might be a little bit more of a desirable setting for a drum set, but there's a lot of top end in there, right? So we can compensate. Now essentially this is an EQ tilt filter and we can change the center of that filter by moving this guy right here. So you're going to get different tones, of course, depending upon where you set this. Let's try to set this above where the Tom's fundamental is, which is likely somewhere below 300 hertz. And of course lower. Now when I set it lower, you can hear that the tom is not reacting as much to the distortion stage, right? So that's why that exists. Okay, let's move away from this section and show you something else. At this point, you're probably like, wow, that is really brutal. Well, just remember that we have a dry-wet control. I saw so few channels covering the fact that you can pull the dry-wet control down, right? So if this was at zero and I wanted to just enhance the drums, right? use Roar as a mixing effect, I can simply bring in the dry wet until I like it. So I'm adding a lot of distortion. Let's add a little bit more drive here. Right, I can get some really interesting results there. Another thing to show you is that Roar has an extremely basic but really good sounding compressor, okay? So with the dry wet all the way up, let's return drive to zero, okay? And I'm gonna pull the amount back. And let's go ahead and introduce some of this compressor. Now I'm gonna turn the output up to compensate for the compressor kind of making the signal quieter. Now, I don't know about you, but with the tone control as it is, this is a really pleasing parallel processing move right here, right? So let's turn the dry wet all the way down and reintroduce this until we like it. Amazing drum sounds, right? So here's without it. Right? Now, that might be more or less distortion than you want, but this is just the setting that I'm enjoying right now. Okay, cool. So the reason I'm showing you this section first is that with any nonlinear effect, it's so important to dial in the sound before it goes into the clipping stages. Because I know it's really flashy to go into these uh, different clipping modes and then the different routing modes, and yeah, this is gonna be so fun. But if you don't tailor the sound going into Roar, the end result is not gonna be as exciting. So let's move on to another example to demonstrate the next controls. All right, so in this next example, we're just using a operator and it's just a sine waveform, that's it. You probably can't even hear it unless you have headphones on. Now, the thing that I want to emphasize here and something that the devs wanted to emphasize is that Roar excels when you're using basic low harmonic sounds. It's not the only thing Roar can do, of course, and you can feed any signal into Roar and have a lot of fun. But what's fun about using low harmonic waveforms such as sines, triangles, 808 kicks, and so on, is that Roar then takes over the creation of whatever harmonics you wanna add to that signal. Let's go over to the polynomial mode, and this is a really interesting one. So I'm playing down low, and I'm gonna start adding a mount. <laughs> We can hear that this is a really similar sound to doing FM modulation. So if the amount was all the way down and I was back in operator, I could, right? Or I could use, right? A very similar sound, but in this case, I'm just using a raw sine wave, running it through this shaper mode. Now this sound is really fun, and of course, where all the action is, like I've been saying, is modulating parameters inside of Roar. But before we get there, this sound is interesting, but it's not very bright, right? We could make it a lot brighter by using a filter. Now, traditionally, folks look at low-pass, band-pass, high-pass filters, and we think of reducing some aspect of the sound, right? But in this situation, instead of removing harmonics or removing frequency from the signal, we can actually add to it by going down to the resampling mode. Now, check this out. Now, essentially, this is a sample rate reducer, so... We can hear that we're adding actual top end harmonics because we're reducing the sample rate, right? So maybe I'll leave this around up here and I'll check this out. 
So now we've got a classic setup where you can make vowel sounds, right? Right. So let's go ahead and move over to a maybe more traditional clipping mode. Let's use the diode clipping. So this is a really nice one. I'm going to put this back on low pass mode. So taking a listen to this. And so I want to say something about Roar. You're never really hitting the roof. You can always get more out of Roar. You just got to know how to do it. So first of all, let's go ahead and turn the output down and let's feed some more drive into here. So the more we drive this diode clipping and also the more we drive the tube preamp clipping, we're essentially squaring the circle, right? We're creating a square wave out of a sine wave. And as you can see, reflected in an oscilloscope, the waveform looks the same above and below the center line, but we can start to interact with bias. And what this starts to sound like to me is pulse width modulation. So let's go ahead and open up our modulation here. Let's start to move this around. So clicking on bias, I'm gonna set that back to the middle, go to matrix, and I'm gonna move it with the LFO. Now, in order to get it not to rest in the middle as much, I'm gonna switch it over to sign mode. So remember, this is just a normal sine wave, right? And you can't even hear it without roar on. But it gets even better. Let's go ahead and go to our routing mode and go to serial. So this is where a lot of action can happen. Right now, if I were to blend all the way over to 100 down here, we're just listening to stage one. But now I can blend all the way over to stage two, and now we're hearing stage one filtered through stage two. So let's go ahead and, and turn this one up, and we'll use the soft clipper shape. So like I said before, you're never really hitting the roof with Roar. You can always get more out of it. Right? Super insane. So let's go ahead and switch this over maybe to tube preamp. This one tends to be really bright. Now, of course, we can also change the bias, thus introducing asymmetrical clipping, meaning that the top or the bottom of the center line is going to look different. And we can hear with a really biased uh, tube preamp, we can get some really interesting tones here. Now, the interplay between stage one going into stage two, we can take advantage of the fact that there's now a filter between them. So check this out. Let's go maybe to the notch filter and explore what's possible. Oh yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and use LFO2 with a free rate and make it pretty slow. And we're gonna navigate this notch filter between these two stages. So going back into the matrix, Let's go ahead and click on the frequency here, and you can see that it automatically appears. Remember, anything you want to appear in the matrix, just click on the control. I'll start to add this to LFO2. Yet again, with Roar, the action is found in modulating parameters, and that's what makes it stand out, okay? Brad, so one thing before we go, I'm gonna go back to single mode, and I wanna show you something else. We're navigating bias right now, right? Now, if we were to choose a different mode, like Fractal, for example, because Fractal has so many crazy changes, moving asymmetrically through this control will yield a similar result to navigating a wavetable. Take a listen. Let's go ahead and take off the modulation and I'll just do it manually. So these wild clipping modes, especially like trifold, navigating the bias is a, is a similar thing to using wave shaping or to navigating a wavetable. Right? Just wanted to point that out. Okay, so in this next example, I wanted to bring up the fact that Roar does not need to be this insane, wild, like, super ratchet effect, right? It can also be a gentle, beautiful thing. Let's take a listen to this piano. Well, let's go ahead and introduce Roar. And what I've got going on here is the full wave rectifier, essentially adding an octave up. And what I'm doing is I'm blending it 50-50. So let's take a listen to it now. So let's take a look at how we can set this one up from scratch. So loading up a roar, let's, let's go ahead and listen to what happens when we switch to the full wave rectifier. So I'm going to turn it off first. Now turning it on. 
We can hear now that it sounds like the piano notes are an octave up. That's the effect of a full wave rectifier. Essentially, it takes the waveform and halves it. So leaving the amount all the way down, we can mess with the transfer curve by moving bias through. And what this will do is this will actually clean the signal up as I get away from the center. So. Right? So let's go ahead and modulate that, opening up modulation, clicking on bias, and then going into the matrix and adding LFO1 to that. Right? Let's go ahead and slow that effect down a little bit. Let's make it free. Add a little bit of amount. And let's go ahead and drive this a bit. So now we can hear that modulation. Now another thing that we can do is we can load up a bandpass filter. Let's go ahead and uh, focus that toward the middle. So now I've got a sound with a lot of character. So now let's go ahead and use LFO2 and we're gonna modulate that. So we're gonna go to free and let's add this to the filter frequency. So now I'm moving this around slowly. And now if I take dry wet and turn it down a little bit, might need to turn the output up a little bit. Let's take a listen to the result. So yeah, you can use Roar in a subtle way. Another subtle way that you can use Roar, of course, is as a mixing tool. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's a fresh roar, and let's go ahead and add a little bit of soft clipping to this piano. Remember, I need to turn the amount up here and then compensate by turning the output down. So now we have... Now maybe I like the harmonics that are being added here, but unfortunately it's kind of breaking up or clipping too quickly. It doesn't sound very good. Well, I can always go down to multiband mode. Now essentially you can dial in a different clipping stage for each one of these ranges. So everything below 200 hertz, everything between 200 hertz and 2000 hertz, and then everything above 2000 hertz. And of course you can adjust these. And something else to point out, when you switch from single to multiband mode, it will not copy the settings to each one of these stages. And the way that you have to do that is actually right click and you can see that there's these extra options here. So copy stage settings to all those stages. Now, let's take a listen to this. That sounds far and away different than using just single mode. That's because we're not trying to force all of the signal through one stage. Now we can take advantage of some of the things we can do with multiband. So going over to highs, for example, I want more uh, harmonics in the highs. Let's take a listen. Now, of course, I'm adding a lot of level to each one of these, so I'm gonna pull this down a bit. So we can hear that's breaking up and maybe it would sound better to move over to tube preamp and pull the amount down a little bit. Gorgeous. Now we can go down to the lows and work on the lows. And I'm gonna work with the tone control to maybe feed a little bit of the top signal into the clipping stages. And I'm also gonna pull this up a little bit to try to get the fundamentals underneath of the tone frequency. So something like this. Now you can hear the compressors having a big effect on this signal, but this is where I want to show you one other thing. If I turn this sidechain high pass filter off, essentially what will happen is now the lows are going to be completely addressed by the compressor and this will make a more substantial compression effect. So let's go ahead and compare and contrast. So here's without this effect. We can hear that bright, interesting detail that's been brought out by using multiband mode. Now, of course, this is a really traditional use of a multiband distortion and we've done all of this before. But what's really interesting is you can start to dial in crazy effects for each one of these bands. So for example, let's go ahead and introduce some uh, resampling to this band. And of course, you can listen to each band by itself. That's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and dial in maybe an envelope follower. So this is something else I wanted to show you. You can actually dial the envelope follower in to do very specific things. So let's go ahead and turn on our headphones. And what this will do is this will defeat Roar's output and we'll just listen to the sidechain input. So let's go ahead and dial this in maybe to a low frequency.
So now we've got the envelope follower only listening to the lowest lows. I'll turn the gain up a little bit. So now we've got a really dynamic signal. And so we can go into the matrix and we can say, okay, I wanna move this frequency around using this envelope follower. So I'll have to turn the headphones off here. And now we get. <laughs> Amazing, right? So now opening up the other two shaper stages and we get this really interesting new piano sound. Right, so traditional and non-traditional uses of Roar. So one of my personal favorite things in Roar is the feedback section. I'm gonna use the drums from the intro here. So here is the drum pattern without any feedback, and I'm gonna slowly but surely introduce the feedback. <laughs> Just so much fun, right? Okay, so let me explain what's happening here. Let's go back to just the original mode here. Now, when you first load up a roar, you'll have this kind of setup here where you just have a very, very short delay, okay? What essentially is happening here when you turn up a mount is you're sending the output of roar back into the input, okay? Creating, basically cascading distortion. And there's so many different ways that you can benefit from this. First of all, if you start to turn up a mount, when you are under about... 40 milliseconds, you're going to start to hear an emerging note. Okay, so... Right, we can hear that note. Tell you what, let's go ahead and turn these stages down so we can just get a... Now, the thing you have to think about is that this is a nonlinear effect as well. Essentially, the more gain you give the feedback mode, the more it's gonna take off. So I could have a mount up here turned all the way up, but if I have to be careful because if I start to turn a mount up here, we're gonna get it to take off. Now, there are a couple ways to mitigate this. First of all, we're using the compressor all the way up, so it's kind of helping make sure that the, the feedback doesn't take off. And then there's this button down here called Feedback Gate. And with this on, essentially, once it stops receiving input signal, it'll eventually peter out and not just take off and blow your head off, right? But if you start to remove these safeguards... <laughs> you can get some wild effects, right? Now, let's go ahead and load up a brand new roar here, and using the feedback mode, we can hear that note, right? Now, this is a true feedback mode, meaning that it is being sent out of the output and back into the input. So if I filter my first stage, we can hear that the feedback mode is also getting filtered, but, we can also hear that the drums are getting filtered too. And that's why this new routing mode appears and it's called feedback. So essentially we can actually distort the direct signal and we can process the feedback separately. So let's leave the direct signal untouched and going to the feedback, we can actually just filter the feedback. You can also filter the feedback here if you want to use all three or all two or whatever, how many stages you have. You don't have to necessarily put the routing in feedback mode in order to accomplish simple filtering. But that's what's so fun about this. We could actually do something wild. Let's use a comb filter, for example, and this is going to get just totally nuts. And we're going to actually use a comb filter on just the feedback. Got to modulate that, of course. So we're going to go into our matrix, click on the filter frequency and modulate it with an LFO. <laughs> and so, of course, I still have a shaper stage to work on just the drums with. So let's go ahead and choose. So let's go ahead and choose something wild like shards. So the interesting thing about feedback mode, though, is that you can use time mode and you can use it like a normal delay. You could make it really long, for example. Sync it to the clock.
And then using the dry wet control, you can get some really new and wild delays, right? But one of the coolest features is that you can actually sync this to specific notes. Now what's so fun about this is that we can create bass lines using just Roar, right? Now we can actually add modulation to this. So I'll go ahead and duplicate this clip and check this out. If I go over to my envelopes and I go back to here and I click on the actual note, check this out. In the clip, we can see that the Roar's feedback note is now a modulatable parameter. So I can, of course, I can change this to different notes, for example. So let's go with C sharp, G sharp. So now that I've got all those notes dialed in there, take a listen to this. Let's go ahead and turn up the feedback amount. Filter it down. Totally wild, right? I just absolutely love the feedback mode. It's amazing. Okay, so in this final example, I wanna show you that also Roar can add a lot of interest to static and boring sounds. And one thing that we can do is we can use the noise mode to do this. So first of all, let's go over to noise and let's change the filter frequency just by using one of these uh, modes. So, so let's go ahead and use simplex to change the filter frequency. I'm gonna go ahead and add it to noise. And right now it's moving very slow, but we can, of course, put this on free mode and spin it up faster. So let's leave that mode as it is and move over to parallel. And I'm gonna add a second stage. And this time, let's look at a different thing we can do. Now I'm gonna take this filter frequency and modulate it with noise as well, but do it in an opposite manner. So now when one filter goes up, the other filter goes down, and this is causing a really interesting effect to happen. But now another thing we can do is we can switch over to brown mode. And what this is, is this is essentially a noise. And what's awesome about this is that this noise is moving very quick. So we're gonna be moving these parameters super fast. Check it out. Dial back dry wet a bit. And now we've added a really interesting grit to the signal. So loading up a new instance of Roar, let's go ahead and use noise in a different way. I'm opening up modulation, going to noise, switching it to brown mode, and this time, let's work on maybe adding a little bit of distortion to this. And you'll notice that when I take bias and move it to the extremities, it's actually cutting the signal out. So let's go ahead and add noise to this. So we can hear that at very low amounts, we're getting this breakup that's just so interesting. Dialing in dry wet. So as you can hear, we can simulate different styles of like bad signals and like crappy cables and like bad electrical environments and stuff like that and create a really interesting sound, right? So another way we can use Roar to create instability is, let's go ahead and load up a new one. We can go down to the bit crusher mode. And then if we add a mount and bias this out of the center, we can start to get situations where the signal is almost disappearing. <laughs> oh, I just love it. So hopefully the takeaway here is that Roar is kind of designed to take boring sounds and make them more interesting. I would say that that is a lot more of the original intention than to just simply make a multi-stage saturator. If you utilize Roar in the right way, you can take very boring static sounds and move them and shape them into really interesting things that are fun to listen to and engaging for the listeners of your music. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Much love, everybody. Talk at you next time.